All right, it doesn't get any better than that. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is the book we're studying, focusing on the life of David. 2 Samuel chapter 14, we're going to put in at verse 25, we're going to study through chapter 15, verse 12. The topic we're going to find there is this, as part of his campaign to steal the hearts of the people and ascend to the throne of his father, Absalom annually cuts and weighs his plentiful hair. The title of our message, Hair to the Throne. Let's have a word of prayer. If you can do better, email titles at calvaryhanford.com. Father, thank you so much for your word. We're excited, Lord, to hear what you have to say to us through it. More than anything else, Lord, we want to see Jesus Christ reflected in it so that we can be more like him. We can understand his love, his grace, his mercy, the peace that passes all understanding that can be ours as we fellowship with you. Uh, we thank you for these things, Lord. Bless our time in the word in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. In the 1996 fantasy adventure film, Dragonheart, a young prince is mortally wounded. His mother takes him to Draco, a dragon, imploring him to save her son's life. To save him, the dragon gives him a piece of his own heart. In the movies, it's beneficial to share a dragon's heart. But in our real spiritual lives, we must guard our hearts from that great dragon, the devil and Satan. In verse 6 of chapter 15, we'll see that David's son Absalom, quote, stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He was a usurper, a rebel, and an insurrectionist who stole the hearts of men, hoping to ascend to the throne. Absalom can therefore be seen as a type of the devil, who is a usurper, a rebel, and an insurrectionist who hopes to ascend to God's throne. Along the way, he's out to influence as many men as possible against the Lord. Absalom is also typical of anyone who lets the dragon steal a piece of their heart. And it's here that we're going to see the main point of contact and application in our own daily lives. I'm going to organize my thoughts around two points. Number one, when you're not thankful to your king, you let the dragon steal a part of your heart. And number two, when you're not satisfied with your king, you let the dragon steal a part of your heart. First of all, in chapter 14, let's talk about being thankful. Being thankful to God is an incredibly important subject in the Bible. It's more than just being polite when we address the Lord and saying thanks in our prayers. It is a settled attitude of the mind and heart that approaches life by applying the truth that all things really are working together for the good for those who love the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, for example, we're told to, and I quote, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Commenting on this, scholar and Bible teacher D. Edmund Hebert wrote the following, in everything is a duty that is not dependent upon gratifying circumstances. The preposition in points to the circumstances of their thanksgiving in connection with everything, and everything makes the injunction all-inclusive. The Christian should meet adverse circumstances of life, not with a spirit of stoic resignation, but with a spirit of unfailing gratitude. When we realize that God works all things out for good to those who love Him and are yielded to His will, thanksgiving under all circumstances becomes a glorious possibility. Pastor Don McClure uses the illustration of two friends who meet. One asks the other how he's doing, to which he replies, pretty good under the circumstances. His friend then says to him, what are you doing living under them? It's a reminder that as Christians, we are seated in heavenly places. We have the spiritual resources available to us to live far above any earthly circumstances. We can look at this another way. Unthankfulness in the Bible is a key characteristic of the wicked. In the first chapter of Romans, those who have rejected God are described by saying of them, nor were they thankful. When describing the perilous last days, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1 verse 2 said that men would be unthankful. 
In both cases, if you go back and read Romans 1 and 1 Timothy 1, uh, being unthankful is listed alongside other things we would consider terrible and heinous. Here's what I'm concluding from all this. Being unthankful is far more serious than we might think. If I indulge myself in a lack of gratitude toward God for all that he's done for me in saving me, I'm setting myself up for part of my heart to be stolen away. And then I am entering the realm of Absalom. And as we'll see this morning, none of us want to be there. And so look at verse 25. Now in all Israel, there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. When he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels, according to the king's standard. Absalom was People Magazine's most beautiful person every year. I know you look forward to that. You just just out of curiosity. I hate People Magazine, but I, I, I want to know who they think is beautiful. Who's who's the most beautiful person? It was a uh, hands down in in the Old Testament story here of, of David's reign. Abs- oh, yeah, it's Absalom. It's uh, there's nobody as beautiful as Absalom. Uh, his hair was something like Fabio's. Uh, <laughs> Ah, see, I know, I know, you know who Fabio is. I had to Google it. But anyway, uh, 200 shekels, according to the king's standard, about five or six pounds of hair that they would cut off and and then still leave him dutifully quaffed. And and I got to think about that's like a mane. I mean, when you saw this guy, you know, it's like uh, at the end of Beauty and the Beast, the Disney movie, when the beast turns into whoever it is, whatever his name is. I don't know. Does he have a name? I don't know if he does or not. But man, he's got beautiful hair, you know, and it's like a mane. And I got to thinking about this because uh, Absalom is presented in Scripture as a type of the devil. Uh, And the devil in the New Testament is described as what? Going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Uh, And lions have manes, obviously. And so we're looking at Absalom with hair like that. The devil is also described in the Bible as being a beautiful being. It says that he was perfect until iniquity was found in him. I think we have an idea from you know, Dante's Inferno or the movies or, you know, our own mind that the devil is is uh, an ugly uh, individual that hides his tail and, you know, has horns coming out and all of this. And so when he knocks on the door and says, I'm the devil, I'd like to tempt you, you say, oh, you know, you're so ugly. But in reality, he comes to us uh, as an angel of light, as a beautiful being. And as I was thinking about this, you know, I always think of encountering the devil as a lion and therefore being terrified, uh, someone who's going to attack me immediately and tear me to pieces. But Absalom is a, another picture of how the lion operates. Uh, he goes about seeking whom he may deceive. Uh, and there is something attractive about him as well uh, in a terrifying way. He devours with feigned kindness and with deceit and with lies. Now the thing to note here isn't Absalom's good looks but the emphasis he himself placed upon them. This is an annual public ceremony in which he would cut and weigh his hair uh, and make an announcement throughout the land. Absalom's hair weighed six pounds this year. It's up three grams from last year, you know. And uh, this is something to call attention, obviously, to himself rather than to God who had blessed him with his good looks. You know, people who are handsome and beautiful, they act like they had something to do with it. You ever think about that? You had nothing to do with it. It's, a, it's an accident of birth. Uh, you know, you just happen to have two beautiful parents like Pam and I, uh, you know, to create this, uh, this beautiful child. But anyway, he called attention to himself, like I just did. Uh, excuse me for a minute, Father, forgive me. All right. We're always to point people to the Lord. Beware of promoting yourself and beware of those who promote themselves. It's never good. Verse 27, to Absalom were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. 
Now, we always need to be careful ascribing motives to Bible characters uh, because we sometimes make them up ourselves. Uh, But it is interesting to me that Absalom named his daughter after his sister whom Amnon had sexually assaulted. If you've been here for our previous studies, you know that's how this whole uh, arc, story arc began. Amnon, the half-brother of uh, Absalom and Tamar, sexually assaulted Tamar. David does nothing about it. Two years pass. Absalom premeditates the murder of his half-brother Amnon, uh, runs off into exile, and then ends up being invited back into Jerusalem. And that's where we're picking up the story. And so Absalom named his daughter uh, Tamar after his violated sister. And I'm sure, you know, there's a part of that in which he's just honoring her. Uh, but at the same time, it is a constant reminder to everyone from his family that Absalom acted to honor his sister while David did nothing uh, in that situation. And so uh, I, I think we're safe to ascribe some evil motives to Absalom because everything else he does is evil with the intent of promoting himself, keeping himself in the public eye, making himself look better than David. And so verse 28, Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem but did not see the king's face. Absalom should have been punished somehow for the premeditated murder of his half-brother. The worst David did was to shun him. He brought him back from Geshur, and then he said, I'm not going to see you. You can't come into the palace. That's going to be your punishment. Now, regardless that something worse should have happened to Absalom, do you think Absalom should have been thankful that he wasn't executed? I do, but he wasn't thankful. He was not at all thankful. In verse 29, Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Far from being thankful, Absalom was demanding, thinking he deserved the king's favor, when in fact he deserved the death penalty. And so not only was he unthankful that he wasn't punished uh, in a very extreme way that would have been according to the law, he thought that he deserved to be treated Uh, 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 as if he was completely exonerated and had done nothing. And so verse 30, so he said to his servants, you see, Joab's field is near mine and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom's house and said to him, why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom said to Joab, look, I sent to you saying, come here so that I may send you to the king to say, why have I come from Geshur? It should be better for me to be there still. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face. If there is iniquity in me, let him execute me. And so when Joab quit returning Absalom's calls, he had his servants set fire to his barley crop. It's an adult version of a temper tantrum. Uh, now, I was thinking about this. Uh, there is just something really pure about a child's temper tantrum because you know exactly what it is. You, you immediately recognize it. It's recognizable all over the world uh, through many languages. Uh, you, 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 it brings us all together as a race of people is that children throw temper tantrums and some of them worse than others. You know, kids that throw themselves on the ground, beat their head on the ground, scream, hold their breath. You ever had a child hold their breath until you thought they were going to pass out? Wow, it's scary. Temper tantrums are scary. But you know that's what's happening. You, you said no, and all of a sudden it's on. It's just, you know. We used to, there, uh, years ago there was a cartoon that we liked. It was more about teenagers having temper tantrum. It was Katie Kaboom. Do you, who remembers Katie Kaboom? Anybody? Uh, a couple of you are, are cultured. Uh, <laughs> Or carnal, whichever we are. But anyway, and she would just throw massive temper tantrums. And there's just something pure about it because you know that's what it is. There's no mistaking it. It's not like somebody's made a mistake. You say, what is that? Well, that's a temper tantrum. Now, when you get to be an adult, you also throw temper tantrums, but they're not so obvious. They mostly happen in your mind and then they work themselves out in weird behaviors that people think something's not quite right, but you won't cop to it. And so people ask you, are you throwing a temper tantrum or is there something wrong with you? No. I have to be careful because then Pam will recognize all my technique here, but 
I could, I went into more detail first service, but you get the idea, you know. And, and then there's a way, there's a way of just throwing a temper tantrum, whether, even if it's internal and nobody knows what's going on. You know, a lot of times we think if we internalize these things, they're not bad and we forget or we don't like to think about Jesus saying, hey, it's, it's bad to do things externally, like murder people. But if you hate somebody, it's the same thing as far as your heart is concerned. And so even though I'm not literally throwing myself on the ground, you know, screaming and crying and hitting my head against the wall, if I'm doing it internally like Absalom was, it's just as bad. And it's a sign, obviously, of unthankfulness. Uh, I am accusing God of not giving me what I think I deserve. And so not only am I not thankful for what he has done and given me and all, but I think that I deserve more and I'm going to let him and others know about it. And so Absalom felt that the discipline of being shunned from palace life was too harsh for the crime of premeditated murder. Uh, I would submit to you that it was uh, an easy sentence and that he should have submitted to it. Absalom knew David would not execute him. And I love what Absalom says. He goes, if any iniquity can be found in me. Oh, my goodness. He's nothing but iniquity. He's the poster child for iniquity. Absalom, iniquity, you know, is his middle name, practically. There's nothing good about Absalom. His entire mindset is to take over David's throne. And he's going to next week, same time, same channel. But anyway, uh, it's, it's an exciting story. And, and, and so he says, if there's any iniquity in me, let him go ahead and kill me. He knew David wouldn't do that, manipulating him. And it worked. So verse 33, Job went to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom. As king, David ought to have carried out the penalty prescribed by God's law for murder or Gosh, he should have at least continued to shun him. He should have done something. As a father, however, he wanted to show love for his son. By the way, dads and moms, proper biblical discipline shows love for your kids. They are not exclusive. Discipline and love are far from exclusive. Even in the Bible, it says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Uh, And discipline is part of our love for our children. Each of your sons and daughters has the potential to grow up to be an Absalom without proper biblical discipline. Now, Absalom was supremely unthankful that the king had spared his life. His heart was obsessed with its own agenda, which was to ascend to the throne. (coughs) What I'm trying to do today in this section is emphasize how important it is in the Bible to be thankful to God. At some point or other, you will be in adverse circumstances. They are being allowed by God to give you the opportunity to be thankful, not for them, but in them. Be thankful. Sing in the midnights of your life when you feel as though you are in the stocks in a dark, dank prison. There's a power in thankfulness that is wonderful and contagious. Uh, Bottom line, thankfulness is Christ-likeness. Now, let's look in chapter 15 about being dissatisfied, because Absalom was not only unthankful, he was not satisfied. Being restored to palace life was not enough for him. So he'd been in exile. He connived his way back to Jerusalem, and then he was restored to palace life. And he said, still, I'm not satisfied with that, because he had in his mind and his heart the throne of his father, and so he set in motion a campaign to overthrow David. Verse 1, chapter 15. After this, it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. These are symbols of royalty, uh, ways that you designate yourself uh, more than an important person, a king. Absalom provided himself with these symbols. He made it look to everyone as though he were if not the rightful king, at least the heir to the throne. It's so hard for us to look past outward appearances. It really is because it requires patience and discernment. I mean, we we see the outward and we judge on that basis. All of us do. The truth is, though, 
anyone can make themselves look as though they are spiritual. If you are discerning, you can see through the outward trappings. Too often, however, Christians are gullible and we are trusting and we're taken advantage of. Uh, We start following folks whom God has not raised up. Folks who have their own agenda. It may not even be a wicked agenda, but it's their own agenda and it gets us sidetracked into where God wanted us to be, into the release of power and joy into our lives and we move over into some other area instead. There are Absaloms who actually mean well, but be cautious of anyone who sets themselves up as an authority over you. And then uh, by uh, some outward trappings, you think and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe they are an authority, even though they've set themselves up to do that. And so verse two, now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there's no deputy of the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, oh, but I were made judge in the land and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me. Then I would give him justice. Now, there's some talk by scholars, some evidence that David was suffering an illness during this period of time. Psalm 41 which was written during this time, seems to bear this out. David talks about being on a sick bed. If so, you see how cunning and crafty Absalom was. He took advantage of his father's weakness and sickness to use it against him. He had this plan in his heart, but he had to always wait for just the right timing. And David being sick, he couldn't hear all the cases as he normally would. He would have to put people off. In those days, you know, they didn't have much in the way of Internet. Uh, it was back like the days when you had a modem instead. Uh, anyway, it's, it, they didn't have much. And so you would come from some city to have your case heard by the king or one of his deputies. And, you know, you maybe journey a day, three, four, five days, maybe longer than you'd get there. And it would be like, well, the king is sick. He's, he doesn't feel well enough to hear any cases or he can only hear a few before he has to lay back down. And Absalom would be there first thing in the morning. Say, oh, it's too bad, you know, your case couldn't be heard because I know you're right. I haven't even heard your case, but I know you're right. Uh, And, uh, uh, man, if I was able to judge, we could really get a lot of stuff done. I don't know what my dad's doing. You know, he needs to make a provision for this. And, and, uh, you know, it was was wearing on the hearts of the people. They were getting frustrated and thinking, well, yeah, I came, came all the way from Riverdale, you know, to Hanford to have my case heard. And the pastor wasn't in. You know, it said closed on the door. I, I know it was midnight, but where is he? You know, kind of a thing. And and so, you know, this other pro well, I'm I'm here for you all the time, even though they're not, you know, but they say they are. Uh, it's easy to say if you're, you know, for Absalom to say, if I were in that position, oh, man, it would be great because he's not in that position. He doesn't have that responsibility. He doesn't have that authority. He doesn't know what he's talking about at all. And so it's easy for me to say, I'll help you whenever you need help. But but I, I don't. And so Absalom, he's crafty, he's cunning. Everyone has weaknesses and faults. When someone talks down another believer, when they point out their faults, they're acting in the spirit of Absalom, so just don't do it. And don't be drawn away by it. If the only way a person can make themselves look good is by making someone else look bad, that should be a warning to you. (coughs) Absalom always agreed with the people. That, too, is a huge red flag. Verse 5, and so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Let me say this. It's easy to be the good guy, to be the person who always sympathizes. But that's not spiritual, is it? I always want to be the good guy, and so do you. But sometimes you must speak the truth in love Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Verse 7, Now it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. 
Now, this use of the words 40 years is actually kind of difficult. Uh, For one thing, David's entire reign only lasted 40 years. So it's clear that the writer doesn't mean that Absalom carried on like this for 40 years. Some scholars explain it as a scribe's error in translating the Bible and say that it should read four years. Uh, But there's no real evidence of how long this took place. Others say it describes the period of time from when Israel first demanded a king and Saul was chosen. It's even been suggested that maybe Absalom was 40 years old. We don't know. All we know is that the people reading this, uh, the original audience would have understood the reference. And what we can say for sure is that Absalom didn't wait 40 years to carry out his plan. And what was that plan? It was to go to Hebron and announce that he was the rightful king. Absalom had been born in Hebron, and undoubtedly he would have family and other support there. It was also the place David was first acknowledged as king over Israel, so it had historic significance to all Israelites. Absalom pretended he was doing something spiritual. He said, I'm going to go pay a vow. I'm going to go do something spiritual, when in reality he was leading a rebellion. It's easier than you might think to convince yourself or to be convinced that your rebellion is really something spiritual. Over the years, for example, I've uh, been aware of many uh, church splits, uh, you know, uh, either here in this community or in other communities as people have talked to me on both ends. Maybe those that are uh, the pastoring the churches or others who are trying to split from the church. Uh, and, And almost always, almost always, without question, Church splits have nothing to do with real issues or what I would call real issues. They're not. And so when people call me and they tell me, you know, we're we're getting ready to split. uh, We we know we can't take it anymore. I say, well, what what's the doctrine that that is bothering you? What what change in teaching and doctrine is bothering you? The doctrine's okay. All right. So what sin is being committed by the leader or leadership over there? Well, you know, we wouldn't really call it sin. Well, what do you call it then? Well, and then they have some spiritual reason for it. There's something spiritual because no one wants to say, we just want to rebel against God's appointed authority and do our own thing. I think I should be king. And because you know, nobody says that because when you say that, you're busted. You bust yourself. And, and so, uh, you know, these kinds of things, these are the more subtle things. Uh, you know, when you talk about unthankfulness and lack of satisfaction, these are things we don't normally think about as sins. Or as problems, we think, well, I'm okay in the big areas over here, but, you know, I can indulge myself a little bit over here. And then the Bible comes as well. You know, not really, because the more you indulge yourself in this, the more of your heart you're giving to the enemy. And finally, one day you're saying something that is pretty ridiculous on the surface. And if if you could strip away all of the spiritual language you're using, what you're really saying is we just want to rebel and do our own thing Uh, We're not really interested in God's authority that he's raised up. We are our own authority. And it's pretty frightening when you get to that point. Now, Absalom said, then I will serve the Lord. What's fascinating about that is Absalom never, ever served the Lord. Uh, Not as a young man, not as an old man, not at this time. His idea of serving the Lord was being the leader, but it never cost him anything. He just uh, he, he believed that he was born to lead. Uh, and never did anything to serve the Lord. You know, I, I, again, we have to be careful uh, about his life and his story because we only know what the Bible tells us. But compare him to David, uh, the, king that, the, uh, the man after God's own heart, the king that God raised up. I mean, David for 13, you know, first of all, David's a young man. He's a shepherd. He's, he's killing lions and bears to protect little ewe lambs that, you know, uh, hey, go for it. I'm not going to fight no bear, you know. Uh, I'm not going to kill a, a lion, you know, for to save a lamb. But David was doing that as a young teenager. Then he kills Goliath. He comes out there and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I can take this guy. I don't even need any armor. I'll just use my sling because the Lord's going to give me the victory. Thirteen years he's uh, in exile as Saul is trying to kill him. Uh, you know, and I mean, this is a guy that, yes, he had his departures and we've talked about those, but this is a man that God had molded and shaped who had been in the crucible of suffering and, and affliction as a shepherd knew how to shepherd people and all of that. And then he has a son, Absalom, who's, you know, happens to be the most beautiful man ever. Uh, with this huge mane of hair and his big service to the Lord is every year he cuts his hair. 
and he weighs it out and he says, man, my hair weighs six pounds. Follow me, you know, and that's his service that as far as we know, he's not in the military. He doesn't fight any battles. He doesn't go out for the Lord. He's not a shepherd. All he does is murder his half brother. And then he says, I will serve the Lord. When? When I get to be king, then I'll start serving the Lord. Hey, how about you serve the Lord now? Here's a broom. Here's a brush. Go clean a toilet. You want to serve the Lord? This is the toilet that the Lord's people use. Go clean it. No, that's not what I had in mind. I'm going to serve the Lord by leading the Lord's people. Well, who's going to clean the toilet? I'll tell them to clean the toilet because I'm the leader. I think you get the idea. Jesus, he said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and lay my life down and be a ransom for many. Uh, And so we need to really, really be careful in this area. So verse 10, then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem and they went along innocently and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, <coughs> excuse me, David's counselor from his city from Gilo, uh, while he offered sacrifices and the conspiracy grew strong for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. 200 men, undoubtedly men of influence, would be pressured by circumstances uh, to go along with Absalom's rebellion. Tells me that I can become an unwitting pawn in someone else's scheme if I'm not careful. And so Absalom, he invited these 200 guys uh, under the pretense that they were all going to be worshiping God and having a great time of fellowship in Hebron. And then he led them along. And when he finally is in Hebron and surrounded by many more people that are supporting his rebellion, the 200 cow to him and they say, well, uh, I guess, you know, we're here now. And Absalom says he's the king and David's sick and maybe maybe this is from the Lord. We'll just go ahead and follow Absalom. And it's a warning to us that we can be drawn along when we don't really know what we're doing. It can be innocent. Ahithophel, we'll see in subsequent weeks, he was disgruntled and as a result was open to a change of administration. And so Absalom played to his dissatisfaction. If you and I had been around in Israel during this time, it might have seemed that God was raising up Absalom to take David's place on the throne. Outwardly, it made sense. David was sick, maybe dying. In fact, you might even think God was judging David for his sins and that it was a time for a change. And Absalom, okay, he was a murderer and he never served anybody and there's nothing to really spiritually commend him to you, but he's an obvious outward choice to be king. But we know that this is rebellion and we should know better. People who Absalom was counseling and kissing were not satisfied with their king. Either he was too sick to see and hear their cases, or he judged them in a manner they were not happy with. Ahithophel was not satisfied with the king, and of course, Absalom was not satisfied serving his father, the king. And so all of these individuals uh, were dissatisfied, and their dissatisfaction led them, brought them to a place where they could be manipulated. In our spiritual lives, we tend to forget that our satisfaction must come from our relationship with Jesus Christ, period. I must be satisfied with the Lord in what he's done for me, in who he is to me, and then I can find his satisfaction in the other areas of my life. So often, however, I get the idea of being satisfied backwards. I'm feeling unsatisfied in a circumstance. Maybe it's my marriage. Maybe it's my church. Maybe it's my job. I think that I must get satisfaction in order to have a better relationship with the Lord. I've had people tell me that uh, their marriage is hindering their relationship with the Lord. That their job is hindering their relationship with the Lord. That their church is hindering their relationship with the Lord. And that's like a a golden ticket, I guess. It's like, hey, I want to have a great relationship with the Lord, so I have to get out of my church, I have to get out of my job, I have to leave my marriage, I'll find a better one, and then everything will be great. And the truth is, that's indicative of a person whose heart has been stolen and who is 
had some bad thinking going on because the truth is, the counsel for them is, you find satisfaction in Jesus Christ alone and then you will go back into your marriage, you'll go back into your job, you'll go back into your church and you will have joy and you will make a difference. You will be a testimony, you will be a witness, etc., etc. And so sometimes you get the cart before the horse. And so I leave my marriage for another one. I quit my church for another one. I get the new job thinking it will satisfy me. All the while the Lord is there saying, are you satisfied with me? Regardless your circumstances. Because again, we don't live under our circumstances. We're to live above them with the Lord. He and I, you and him, tackling them together. And if you're always looking at your circumstances for satisfaction, you'll never be satisfied with the Lord. He'll never be, because your circumstances can never be what you think they should be. There will always be an emptiness there. And so dissatisfaction causes me to look at the world wrongly, causes me to spiritualize my carnal thoughts and actions. It causes me to be Absalom. Am I thankful? It's a command. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Maybe every counseling session should begin. People come in and they say, hey, I've got this problem or that problem. You say, well, number one, do you want to know what the will of God for you is? Yes, absolutely. Your will of God is for you to be thankful in this circumstance. Not for it. I'm not saying that it's great. I certainly wouldn't want to be you. Of course, you don't want to be me either. You know, we each have our own thing going on. But, but God says, first and foremost, one of the main things is, in everything to give thanks. So let's work on that. No, no, let's work on the marriage. Let's work on this. Let's get another job. No, let's work on giving thanks. Because then you're growing spiritually and when you get to that point, hey, you won't care anymore about it being a terrible job. In fact, you'll look forward to it. I want to tell you that there, a part of me, when I first got saved, I hated my job. Because I hated it before I got saved. I hated it even more after I got saved. But I loved the opportunities and was thankful in it because I could share Christ in a way uh, that was unique and amazing. Uh, and, and so, you know, you need to get your satisfaction from the Lord alone and it will change all of these other things. And so thankful and then satisfied by that, I mean, is Jesus enough for me or do I demand a certain set of circumstances? Unthankfulness and dissatisfaction give the devil his opportunity to steal away parts of my heart. It gives him a power over me that I really don't want him to wield. Thankfulness and satisfaction guard my heart for Jesus. When I am practicing them as disciplines in my life, Jesus and I can go on supping together in the fellowship he created me for and saved me into. Let's pray.